Heritage Board. Um, Austin DeYoung here is my my right hand for the summer and been here last summer and he's really helped me a lot with um, working with the DeCooks and, and having the opportunity to bring swans to the DeCook wetland. So I would also like to have um, Mr. and Mrs. DeCook and Mike and Dan and thank them for allowing this opportunity to happen and allowing the people to get firsthand knowledge on what it takes to rewild your farm in your area and things that we can look forward to in the future with stewardship and changes that we can all make and take into consideration <coughs> not only for wildlife diversity but for water quality, for flood control. Um, it's almost an endless opportunity when it comes to wetlands and uh, they're about the most diverse habitat of any habitats of all which is pretty incredible with all the things that they see here and I think Mike had said there were thousands of waterfowl here earlier and the clouds would just come in as ducks and, and geese and things like that. We've already seen pelicans. Um, I know that there's an eagle here, great blue herons. Uh, Ron Holsey's been here photographing a lot, finding mink and otter and I know there's all kinds of frogs and things that we don't even see that exist here and uh, I'm going to have one of you come and talk about your farm here in just a minute but I wanted to talk a little bit about the swan history. This is a swan that is native to the state of Iowa. It was an endangered species for many years and then the Department of Natural Resources decided to do a restoration project starting in 1995 and they brought uh, some trumpeters in. They put them in a fenced-in area. They were not flying birds, but they had opportunities with county conservation boards and uh, volunteers who had open water areas with fences so that they wouldn't leave and hopefully that they would raise young. Um, they're about three or four years old before that even becomes a success for nesting. But in 1988, or 1998, 99, and 2000, the first and second wild trumpeter swan babies were hatched, and that was the first since the late 1800s. So really there were only about 62 pair of trumpeters in the United States at one time, and now there are 42 active nests in the state of Iowa with help of people like the DeCooks and others who have taken the trumpeters under wing and um, have watched over them and considered you know what to do with the stewardship of the land and wetland education and use them as more of an ambassador to uh, the whole educational process. So I, I want to take any questions that you might have about the swans. We will get them out and everybody will have the opportunity to touch them um, and uh, the cooks will be more than happy probably to release them here pretty soon too. Um, would you or Dan like to come up and talk a little bit about I think that would be awesome. What do the swans eat? They are tubers and a plant eater, macroinvertebrates, things like that. Um, so they don't eat meat. Um, they met their demise basically because of overhunting. There weren't any hunting laws. Uh, they used the feathers, the course is down, you know, for warmth. Um, quill pens, uh, powder puffs for women because the skin is so supply soft. And um, I'm sure that they utilized a good portion more of the trumpeter. But we also have an exotic swan that has come into the state of Iowa that gets confused with the trumpeter, and that is the mute swan. And the mute is the one that you always see in pictures on your greeting cards, and they have the bright orange beak and the little knob in the center, and they really uh, hold their posture somewhat different than the trumpeters, but those are an exotic species. They are not native to the state. And the only other, um, the other one that flies over that nests in the tundra are the tundra swans, and they look almost identical to the trumpeters. And they have a little yellow teardrop next to their beak and their eye, and they're a little bit smaller species. But, um, you know, when, when we had a lot of wetlands in the state, we had a lot more swans flying and passing through on migration, and so 
the hunting of all swans, you know, were really going down a population. It wasn't just the trumpeter, but the trumpeter really took took its toll. Now they reached their demise basically through being shot, being mistaken for um, uh, snow geese. Sorry, <laughs> for snow geese and lead poisoning. So they pick up grit. Uh, they have that gizzard, and so they pick up. Uh, fishing sinkers and things like that and any exposure to lead it takes just a little bit so that's kind of been something that has really not just the waterfowl but eagles and any other birds too that have a gizzard they are ingesting lead and so we're finding it an increasingly big problem um, for that so it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort for people to bring back species, just like the Canada goose. I heard somebody talk about they didn't see Canada geese years ago. Now there's plenty of Canada geese. We wouldn't have wood ducks if it wasn't for the people. We wouldn't have bluebirds. We wouldn't have eagles. We wouldn't have all these things that bring us back, not only to our heritage, but we're reliving history once again. We're making history. We're reliving history. So. Any other questions about the swans real quick? And, the and I want them. trumpeter, do they have a voice? They do have a voice. It sounds very much like a French horn. It's um, kind of a, a trumpet sound. They hiss a lot too, by the way. <laughs> so why weren't they the French horn swans? I don't know. I don't know. Some say a trumpet, I say French horn. It's kind of a controversy there. Kind of a controversy. <laughs> Marla, maybe you said already, uh, where did the swans originate? Um, these swans actually are 11 months old, mm -hmm. and they came. One came from Jackson County in Iowa, and one came from Pocahontas. Um, yes, Pocahontas County. Yeah. And um, not sure which is which. Uh, they do have a leg bracelet. Uh, the male has a bracelet on the right leg, and the female has one on the left. Um, and this species. Pardon? Is that a protocol? Uh, it is for the restoration project for ones that um, have been raised or wild pairs that they're taking the signets and placing them into specific portions of the state. What I mean is that you could tell the gender uh, by which... Uh, internally. By they they pretty much have to internally check them. Mm -hmm, but yeah. I mean, the male would always have it on the one side and the female on the other. That's what this Iowa has done. Yes, Iowa has done that to be consistent. And the state also uh, used to put bracelets on their neck. Um, they don't do that anymore. They ran out of those about three years ago, and which is fine. It's perfectly fine. They look wilder this way. Um, and that was kind of a recommendation. They didn't really want the, the neck bracelets. But I kind of find that as possibly a hindrance to um, this is this is probably the better way of doing it. It's just not easy to read and monitor them. So if you would see one and get your binoculars out and you'd see OA, um, you're probably not going to know where this one is and where it's been and when it was banded and where it was hatched. And that information probably isn't going to be there like the other ones. But there's been enough time passed since 1995. They have good records. They know, and people are watching the swans and really monitoring them very closely. Where do they keep the records? That is through the Department of Natural Resources, through the Wildlife Diversity Program. Um, that's up in Clear Lake, actually, is where that office works with this restoration program. Um, I work a lot with the Boone program, with the raptors, uh, the osprey. And of course, they've done peregrine falcons, and they did the otters. And there's been numerous types of projects that revolve around wetlands and water quality uh, through the state. And it seems like we're always kind of the last state out of 10 or 11 surrounding states to get on board. And all these birds would pass through, and they would just stop and keep on going. And we'd like to have some of our, our original native species back, too, and keep them here. Um, and some people have actually put swans back on their wetland to be stewards of the swans in the wetlands to keep their children here. Because we do have a lovely place here in Iowa. We do have wonderful wildlife. You don't have to leave Iowa to find things that are so special. So, any other questions? Okay, you're up. 
great. Well, we'd, we'd like to thank Marla, first of all, Definitely. for doing all thank this. Thank you, Marla. She's oh, uh, you're uh, you're done, 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 done. Okay. And this is just a, we call it a rant, but it's my folks is Mark and Kay. They're the moms holding your, uh, what, what do you call them? <laughs> and, uh, but just a little little bit about we're uh, we're an organic grazing ranch. Um, we were raising organic grass-fed beef, and now we're gonna we're gonna be here in the future gonna be switching to organic grass-fed bison. So that's our big. Uh, but it's a working ranch, and the main I guess one of the main things that we're real passionate about is our our love of protecting open space and natural areas. An undeveloped land, and uh, also our, our our passion of ecological restoration. We're real passionate about uh, uh, restoring our prairies and our oak savannas and our forests and our wetlands. And we're trying to mix all that with with a working ranch and making a living off it. And it's kind of a interesting and fun thing to do. But uh, Dan, do you have anything to? No, I think well said, bro. <laughs> so, I might just add that this used to be all row crop. A farmer down the road farmed it, and the government had a program where they wanted to clean the waterways, especially the rivers, and so they paid us some money to put this into a wetland, but then we had to pay to have the dozers come in and carve in the spots where the water is. But uh, then... Uh, but that's what the, the government actually initiated it because of the effort to clean the waterways. So and the, the, the flooding every year also initiated yeah, it. Yeah, we, would, we, we would lose a crop. We could not get a crop. Every three years. <laughs> <laughs> that was the effort. Yeah. 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 And I would like to input on that in behalf of the Cooks. This wetland is not just in wetland reserve for 20 or 30 years, it's a lifetime easement. So this is something that's here to stay. It's not just a, a part-time wetland and just here for a short while. So that is very commendable. And hopefully it increases, and while we've already seen that, the diversity of, of waterfowl and wildlife here, uh, but also economically, I think it's a benefit to farmers and ranchers downstream because mm -hmm. it holds and retains the water, and, and obviously the water quality has improved. And most, so. most of those hills, our uh, coal mine spoils that were, have grown over over many, many years. We planted quite a few trees in there. Is there a concern that this will dry over a, a drought period of time and then what happens to the wildlife? That's actually uh, what, what you want. They want it to, in the dry times to, to draw down. That's really good for wading birds and stuff. To, for food. You know, for herons and egrets and where the swans come back if that's dry? Yeah, yeah. Um will they invest in dry ground? They will. Yes they will. Uh, they like the, the vegetation that surrounds wet areas. That is it's not you don't have to have water and you don't have to have fish. They like wetlands and they like how the structure of the wetlands work. And also for the plant species, you know, you can you don't have a drawdown structure, do you? This is all, it's all natural. It's all natural. Yeah. Some people, when they actually put in their wetlands, they they want to be able to remove those logs and they want to regulate the water and drop it down for certain periods of the year, depending on migration and, and food sources and things like that. And so they will regulate that themselves. And um, actually, the diversity of the plants, it all comes back to the diversity of, of what lives here. So. We just kind of live by diversity. It depends on diversity. So if the more you have, the more you're going to get. And uh, I guess it's true in this that if you build it, they will come. And uh, those species, these birds and things that are visiting here will also be planting other species of wetland types of plants and, and bringing in different uh, macroinvertebrates and different healthy things that need they need for this wetland. And so it's just a constant change. Uh, there's a nice muskrat hut. How important are muskrats to wetland succession? They are extremely vital to wetland succession. So everything here has its own niche and they all work it together and these animals can actually create more homes than we can. You know, they do it on their own. Uh, if we just allow it, sometimes we just got to give them that little boost. Are these birds going to migrate or? 
Yes, they will migrate in the fall. Um, actually, one wing is clipped, and so they, they are not going to be flying back and forth at this point. They are going to be molting within the next month and a half to two months, where they will shed a good portion of all their feathers, so no swans fly during that molt. Um, they will lose their gray tone, so when we get them out, you'll see more of that gray that shows that they are still a cygnet. Um, <clears throat> they will be more white when maturity comes. Um, they will stay here till probably October. I don't know how, October, November. I'm not sure how fast your wetlands freeze, but once they freeze, they will just move to open water. Doesn't mean they're gonna move to another state. Uh, they may stay in Iowa, they may end up in Missouri. It's hard to say where they're going to go. Um, but they will, they will just go to places that have open water. I know, Ron, you've captured how, how many photographs of trumpeters below the dam in the winter, whether they be cygnets. Um, there's been, what, were they two adults that you yeah. saw below the dam? I've been watching them fly back and forth white grass on Highway 14. Um, so trumpeters move around considerably, but yes, they do migrate. They're just not a neotropical migrate migratory bird like uh, the osprey where they would go to Venezuela and back so that way it's a global and local migration this is more of your local migration this is open water that's all they need open water where there's food so well, the one that we saw below the dam that was, it was one uh, mute and then one trumpeter immature and that was starting in November yeah. and they pretty well stayed there until February and then they picked up four more trumpeters, but during the month of February, for the last three years, there has been six always below the dam, usually during the month of February. And two, with all of our reservoirs now and the way things, you know, have changed, there is a lot more open water available in Iowa than there used to be. So you notice pelicans staying the winter, you notice trumpeters staying, you notice the Canada geese. A lot of the Canada geese have lost their migratory patterns due to being pen raised and restored back in that way. Um, they all have their own little niches, but as long as their needs are satisfied, they don't have to migrate a, a long distance anymore. But migration, all it means is moving. So, you know, moving from here to, from this wetland to that wetland is migration, you know, to a lot of different things. but. Um, yeah, we don't know where they're going to go. It could be one state over, it could be one county over, you know. It could be below the dam for all we know. In the DNR experience, what is the likelihood that they return to where they're released? That's kind of why we want to keep them here as long as we possibly can. So they're here in April, they will leave in maybe November, October, late October. Um, and then as time goes on, they they have a successful year here of, you know, not having to fight too hard for survival, then they will probably come back. But they're also an invitation species where other birds flying over, you've already had trumpeters here at your wetlands, you're going to have stopovers. It's just let's try and, and keep them here and maybe it will initiate a response that when they become three or four, that you will have a nesting pair, or it will bring in a nesting pair that's flying in from someplace else. We, we had we had one wild trumpeter swan last year, and it was it bonded with a pair of Canadian geese, <laughs> and it would do whatever they did. They would fly, it would fly with them right behind them, and they circled back and landed. The swan would circle back and land. So I don't know if it lost a mate or didn't find a mate. Well, they do mate for life, um, and if they lose a mate, sometimes they'll skip a year. Um, they kind of go through a mourning pattern too. They don't bond right away with some, you know, another female or male, depending on how that works. And um, it's just how, how nature works. But uh, when they are nesting, you will know when one is nesting because I can guarantee there probably will be nothing else around. That male will just really get a, a little attitude going and make sure that nothing is going to come into that territory, whether it be people, Canada geese, <laughs> or anything else, um, they pretty much clear it out when they have eggs. And their eggs are almost as big as my hand. I mean, they're very, very large eggs, and they will have anywhere from four to six. Occasionally, they might have seven if they're an established pair. 
but you know it's got to it's got to go three or four years before they can even have that um, success rate of at least a, a good nest. Um, and like I I talked to the kids too, you know when you work with nature, it's patience. There's no instant gratification here. You're not going to tell a story tomorrow, and you're not going to tell it the next day. But you ask me in 15 or 20 years, and I'll probably be able to tell you something that's been a success. Because you don't put time elements on nature. Um, it will work as fast as it can work. If you take it away a lot faster, it just takes a lot longer to get it back. And um, so watching them, we just have we learn from them. You know, this has been a great learning experience for. Austin got to do this at college last year at Kirkwood. This is my first experience of handling swans, and they're different. You know, a bird is not a bird. <laughs> you know, it's like a, this is a lot different than osprey and eagles and owls and hawks and things that I deal with. But this, these are birds are incredible. Um, but you learn something new about something each and every day, and that's what keeps you going, and that's the motivation, you know, of all of us. You know, when we work with the land. And, you don't know everything, um, and you never will. And they will make a liar out of you every single time. So um, you never say never when it comes to wildlife or nature. <laughs> so are we ready to get the swans out? Yes. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There's your buddy. How about the same size? Yeah, the, the males eventually will be a little bigger, but I think they're both in between 20 and 25 pounds right now. We've got a little bit to go yet, but this yeah. one, is this the which one is this? This is the female. That's the female. The males with more problem. Yep. Yes, thank you. She. <laughs> 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 now, how heavy are they? Um, actually, they've got another eight pounds to go. Um, I think he is about 20. She's about 18. So they go anywhere from 28 to 32. So um, we're going to take the opportunity at this time so that you can touch them. Um, look at their eyes. They've got an amazing <laughs> nictitating membrane. Um, and... Uh, Boy. When do they get the yellow? Or the, where's, the, where's the yellow? That's the tundra. That's the tundra. Oh, tundra. Yeah, that's the tundra. These ones are all black. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see under the lips they've got red lipstick though. Yep. Uh, yeah. And the tundra does too. Um, they look very similar. The tundra and the, this, the tundra has the yellow. That's the best yep. way to tell them apart. Yep. Yeah. And the size, the tundra won't get near as big, but pretty much other than that, they're identical. Black. Is there a value on these? I mean, if you wanted to go ahead and buy some in the establishment. Oh, um, there are numerous places that the state has chosen uh, to do those pen rays, trumpeters, and that's where these signets come from, um, whether they be county conservation boards or, or not. They used to give $500 for placement, uh, same way with the Osprey, and that's just to cover medical expenses or... Um, <laughs> or some type of <laughs> I know you've been pinned up way too long there we go there we go um, so yes there there is value that people have done and it's just to help defray the cost there there was a lot of money bequeathed to the state for the trumpeter swan program so you would have trade swans marlo she wanted that one i wasn't gonna fight her for it please do take the opportunity to come up yeah touch them touch their neck feel the down they have the most incredible down um Look at their feet. So they're very soft. Oh, wow. They're very supple. Uh, very reptilian. Um, they're gonna. <laughs> she's gonna give Austin a hug. Just be but, careful uh, with the feet here, though. Yeah. And actually, feel up here on the neck. It's just incredible. 
I'm sorry. Goodness. They've got 24 vertebrae in their neck as compared to a giraffe that only has seven. So, how many is it? 24 vertebrae versus a, a giraffe has seven. Seven. Okay. So, I'm going to post myself up in this thing. All right. Good picture of everyone, even the swan. They've got little, little claws or. They have very sharp nails. Is it like six feet wingspan or a little um, more? It's about eight. Eight feet? Yeah. Oh, aren't they the biggest wow. waterfowl? Yeah, they're the largest waterfowl in, in the world. In the, in the, yeah. In the world? Yeah. In the world? Yeah. Wow. So. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. 